technology gremlins smile upon us. Um, we'll be turning this over to Dr. Peterson to present slides from uh, his office. So we'll see how this works. All right, as soon as you can see my screen, let me know. I can see it. Perfect, and we'll get started. Um, so yeah, I'm Andy Peterson. I'm one of the sports medicine physicians here at the University of Iowa. Uh, we've got a fairly large program. We've got a fairly new sport concussion program that has grown exponentially over the last couple of years. Um, I came in to lead that, um, and we've had a fairly successful uh, group. I'm used to doing these in a more interactive format, so it's a little bit weird for me to be doing this as a webinar. So I encourage you to ask questions as we go along. I can't always see the questions um, as I'm presenting my slides, and I'll have some videos to show you as well. Uh, but we'll stop every now and then to look at the questions. So boy, I encourage you to take a look, um, to, to put in any, any questions that you might have. I'll catch um, those for you, Andy, and give them to you as we get there. Okay, that's great. You bet. Um, I, don't, I don't have any important uh, disclosures. I do occasionally talk about off-label use of medications for the treatment of post-concussion um, symptoms. There aren't really any on-label medications uh, that we use for post-concussion syndrome. Um, and I'll probably only discuss one brand of neurocognitive testing, computer-based neurocognitive testing, but there are several of these on the market, so don't feel like impact is the only game in town. There's some other good ones out there. We're going to spend some time talking about the definitions of concussions, basic pathophysiology of concussions, and some real basic epidemiology. Um, but we're going to focus most of our attention on recognition, the initial evaluation of a concussion, and what return to play uh, should look like. As Jeff was saying, this has gotten a lot of attention lately. Um, probably no higher profile case. Uh, uh, no higher profile case recently than Junior Seau. Um, so interesting, interestingly, Junior um, did have his, have his brain um, biopsied and, and sent to the lab in, in Boston. That's been seeing a lot of uh, former professional football players, former boxers um, with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And interestingly, Junior did not show any evidence of uh, tau encephalopathy or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So what am I talking about there? Since that's the thing that kind of is, is getting in the news a lot, we might as well start right there. Um, th these are three pieces of brain. So the, the one on the left is a normal 65-year-old. Um, the one in the middle is John Grimsley when he died at age 46. He was a professional football player, had about a 15-year um, career with a couple of teams. And then on the far right is a uh, former world championship boxer who had profound dementia and, and died a little bit later in life. Um, and the, uh, the, the brown areas here, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but the brown areas here are tau deposition. Tau is a protein um, that is important for stabilizing microtubules, including axons. So it, it um, is, is a very important structural protein in the brain, but it also acts as a scar tissue. So when there is damage around axons, uh, tau um, protein gets deposited, and you see these tau deposition uh, diseases. And these are associated with, um, with dementia, uh, depression. Um, and other problems associated with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It happens to also be very similar to the um, to the type of uh, pathology that's seen in Alzheimer's disease, um, and so that's why chronic traumatic encephalopathy and uh, Alzheimer's have uh, so much in common clinically. Oops. Dave Durson um, was the the case that uh, most people knew of before. Uh, Junior Seau, he was a former Chicago um, Bears football player who shot himself in the chest um, because he was having such profound problems with chronic traumatic encephalopathy and asked that his brain be donated to science. Um, and Dave uh, showed fairly profound tau encephalopathy um, throughout his brain, um, consistent with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And so this is the main reason that concussions have gotten a lot of attention lately is because of these long-term uh, issues and people that have had a lot of, um, a lot of concussions. But we, you know, that's not what we spend the bulk of our time in concussion care. We spend the bulk of our time helping someone who has an acute concussion get back to play safely. So these are kind of two separate uh, issues. And this is about all I'll talk uh, about chronic traumatic encephalopathy, even though that's the part that ends up in the news the most. And the reason we don't focus on it um, as much is because we're simply not as good at it. You know, we're, we're pretty good at making sure that someone has, has healed completely before they're put back at risk, but we're not very good at determining how many injuries is too many or, or, or how, how safe um, it is for someone to go back and put themselves at risk when they've had several concussions. Um, if we had more, more data, we could have a more interesting conversation about it, but right now we just don't have much data. Um, we're going to move on to talking about concussion definitions here a little bit. Um, the first modern uh, concussion definition was from 1966, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, um, and it's actually a pretty good uh, definition. Um, really focuses on the clinical aspect of concussions rather than focusing on some structural or, or pathophysiologic um, 
uh, change. Um, and, and that's what the modern definitions are like as well. I'm not going to read these to you. Um, you'll have access to these slides and you can read them uh, as you like. Uh, the American Academy of Neurology has a very short uh, definition. Uh, this is their current definition. It's a trauma-induced alteration of mental status that may or may not involve a loss of consciousness. Um, and as you can tell, this was written by a, a small group of people because when you have a definition that's written by committee, you end up with something like what's in the Zurich Statement. So the Zurich Statement is from the, the third international consensus statement um, on concussion care. Um, it was held in Zurich, Switzerland in 2008. It was published in 2009. Um, and the Zurich Statement uh, defines concussion as this complex pathophysiological process that affects the brain that's induced by trauma. Um, and rather than talking about what a concussion is, it talks about the common features in a concussion. And so some of the common features, again, I'm not going to read all these to you, but there's a few important ones I want to make sure we touch on. Um, first one is that it doesn't have to be a direct blow to the head. Um, concussions can be caused by transmitted blows uh, as well. Also important to recognize is that this is a functional problem, not a structural problem. There is still a misconception out there that a CT scan or an MRI um, can diagnose a concussion. It doesn't. There's really not a role for neuroimaging in the vast majority of uh, concussions. It doesn't um, really help us make the diagnosis. It doesn't really change anything about how we approach the problem. Um, and so knowing that most concussions have normal um, neuroimaging studies and that these can um, occur from hits that uh, don't that we don't classically associate with concussion is an important thing to recognize, especially as you're covering sporting events or you're around sporting events where concussions may occur. The common symptoms are probably the most important part. Um, most of you have seen the SCAT2 symptom score, and those are the 22 most common symptoms in concussion. Headache is by far the most common um, symptom of concussion, but there's a lot of other things that can happen as well. There are some common cognitive features as well. Confusion is usually the hallmark of initial, um, uh, of uh, immediately following an injury. Um, the confusion oftentimes gets better before the other symptoms um, get better, but it's usually fairly profound early on after a, a bad injury. Um, there's oftentimes amnesia around the time of the event as well. It can be a little bit of, um, of retrograde amnesia just before the event, and it's very common to have a little bit of anterograde amnesia following a concussion where you have difficulty forming new memories. Rarely there's loss of consciousness, um, but because it's such a, dramatic, um, so such a dramatic event when it does occur, it's included in the Zurich Statement's uh, definition and its list of common cognitive features. There are physical signs you want to be look, looking for on the sideline or, or when you're um, seeing someone who may have suffered a concussion. So impaired consciousness um, obviously should, should get your attention. But then there's some other things that might be a little bit more um, subtle. So they might have poor coordination or balance that you might not notice unless you test it. Um, they might be slow to answer questions or follow directions. They may get the answer right still, but they might answer these questions slowly. You know, I, I um, talked to our fellows about uh, what a concussed player answers questions like on the sideline, and it's not a matter of getting the question right or wrong oftentimes. It's often how they respond. You know, a lot of our younger kids will be very quick talkers most of the time. They're usually very quick thinkers. They're bright, they're bright kids, um, but when they're injured, when they're concussed, they might get the answer right, but they're they're stalling and they're buying time while they're trying to answer these questions. So they'll say things like, oh, come on, doc, that's an easy one. You know that after 93 comes uh, 86. And so they'll, they'll buy time. They'll try to stall. So that kind of slow to answer questions is an important thing that can be subtle sometimes. And most people who have um, met a concussed athlete recognize the vacant stare. Um, it's, it's also fairly profound when you see it for the first time. Um, concussions are probably um, common. It's very difficult to know for sure, though. Um, there are estimates that range from 1.6 to 3.8 million concussions per year in organized sports, and the bulk of those occur in, um, in kids between the ages of 5 and 18 years. But the vast majority of these never come to clinical attention. When I say clinical attention, I'm not just talking about emergency rooms and physicians' offices. I'm also talking about athletic trainers and coaches and anyone else who might be caring for these, um, caring for these athletes. Um, it's, uh, it's very difficult to get an estimate of how many concussions are out there, and that's why our best estimates range um, by a couple of million concussions per year in the United States. So it's a fairly common injury. Those of us who do concussion management know that there's plenty of them out there to keep us in, in business, um, but exactly how many there are is somewhat challenging to know. So I'm going to make the, the next part of this a little bit more case-based um, moving forward. So the first case is a 35-year-old linebacker made tackle during a Saturday afternoon game. 
uh, was a hard helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact. He felt a little dazed following the play. He was evaluated on the sideline using the SCAT-2 method. So what's the SCAT-2? Uh, most of the athletic trainers in the group probably um, have at least seen the form, if not worked with it um, an, an awful lot. Um, but just so that everyone has seen what a SCAT-2 evaluation looks like, we're going to do one right now. So here is uh, here's the symptom score. And so this person, um, uh, this, this person had... Uh, 17 distinct symptoms, so they report 17 different symptoms, and their symptom severity score adds up to 64. So that's the first part of the SCAT-2, and then we're going to pull out of this, and oops, that's not at all what I want to do. We're going to pull out of this and um, show you a video. Of what the SCAT-2 evaluation looks like. I'm going to stop it right there for a second just for a point of clarification. Um, so when I answered both of the series of four numbers incorrectly, that um, should have uh, been the end of the test. I uh, shouldn't have been able to move on to the next part of the test there. Um, but uh, we moved on anyway, so you can see what the, 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 the five numbers looks like. Um, but if you're actually doing this, you wouldn't move on past that. So we'll go back to the video here. Jeff, is the audio quality okay? It, it is for me. Okay, great. One. Oh, I don't know. One more try. One, five, two, eight, six. Six, eight, two.
do some balance testing. Okay? So there's three separate tests. The first one, I want you to have your feet together. You're going to have your hands on your hips and your eyes closed. Okay? And I'm going to count to 20 seconds on my watch. And I'm going to be counting um, any errors you make. So opening your eyes, taking your hands down, stepping to the side. Now, if you have to do that to maintain your balance, that's okay. Now, I don't want you leaning up to the side for a long period of time to take your step and get back um, your center of gravity and we'll start the time. Okay? okay? So, whenever you're ready. So I'm going to pause right there too. Kim explains it, but um, just for the sake of clarification, there's an error, there's a typo on the SCAT2 form that messes people up sometimes. And so this immediate memory score um, is out of 15. You get five, you get five trials of that. And this concentration score is out of five. It actually says out of one um, on the form itself, and then at the bottom it gives you a score out of five, and then in here this thing it says out of 15. So it's really confusing. But this is supposed to be um, five points here for the concentration score, and it's supposed to be worth 15 points for that immediate memory score, um, just to be clear. And Kim explains that a little bit, and I'll rewind to let her uh, explain it. Um, so there's an error on that form. It's only out of, it says it's out of five, but it should be out of 15 because we had two separate times. The concentration score, you got um, one out of one. That means just the numbers back, or the month of the year backwards. And the delayed 
recall you got three out of the five items when I asked you what those items were you know, several minutes later. So the total cognitive score was 21 out of 30, so when you add it all together, it's 79 out of 100. And then um, the other thing is that dramatic score, which is where are we at right now, and you got two out of five. Good. So that's the SCAT 2. Um, I, I know everyone has um, at least been exposed to it, but hopefully seeing someone go through it a little bit more thoroughly is, uh, is, is helpful for people. Now, so moving on with our case. So the athlete's helmet uh, was given uh, to athletic training student. That's my favorite way to make sure that the athlete can't go back into the game, taking away a vital piece of equipment so that it keeps them on the sideline. Um, uh, then the athlete was reassessed on the sideline every 10 minutes, and at the end of the game, they never developed any um, focal neurologic deficits or motor abnormalities, but they stayed, remained dazed, and they did not return to the game. But by Monday, the athlete felt normal. Um, impact testing uh, was used, and it was better than baseline. Uh, the athlete was allowed to return to, to running drills, had no symptoms, and was allowed to return to full contact um, training um, that week and uh, played in the following uh, Friday's game um, and had no problems for the remainder of the, symptom, er, of the season. Um, and, and I use this pattern because this is the most common pattern. So th the vast majority of concussions are very short-lived. Um, and, and sometimes we get fooled by that because we tend to see the worst ones. We tend to see people that have more prolonged symptoms, um, have more problems. They're the ones that are more likely to come to medical attention. Um, but if we're vigilant, we're going to see more and more of these injuries where people have fairly mild uh, injuries. They're not terribly impaired at the time when they recover fairly quickly because this is the most common pattern. But anyway, I mentioned impact testing here. So impact is the type of neurocognitive testing that we use here. Um, we, do have, we do have a question, though. Can I jump in? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yep, no problem. Uh, one of the questions was, I think you mentioned that uh, you reassess uh, every 10 minutes. Yeah. Is, is that with the full SCAT, too? No, it's not really with the whole SCAT 2. You just kind of check in with the player just to make sure that things aren't worsening. I don't typically go through the whole SCAT 2. There are people that do, um, but as you can see from the video, it's a little time consuming. And so if you were assessing every, especially on the, on the sideline of a big football game, uh, where you might have two or three people that have concussion symptoms by the end of a game, if you were reassessing someone with a complete SCAT 2 every 10 minutes, that would be um, fairly onerous from a time standpoint. So it's more a matter of checking in to make sure that they're not having a decline in their mental status, that their Glasgow coma score is still nice and high, that they're not getting more symptomatic, that they're not having more trouble. But I don't typically go through the entire SCAT 2. It's more of a check-in, see how they're doing. Thanks. Good. Other questions? A couple more here. Uh, do you baseline the SCAT 2 in the preseason? Yes, yeah. So it's more useful if you have a baseline SCAT 2. This is actually one of our areas of research here, how um, useful that baseline SCAT 2 is. Um, if you look at the, at the Zurich statement, they uh, recommend getting preseason baseline testing with the SCAT 2 and, and say that it can be helpful for interpreting post-injury test scores. Um, they don't, there's no, there wasn't any data on that at the time. So that was, that was kind of expert opinion part of the, um, of the Zurich statement. And it's getting to be, it's become an uh, area of controversy in concussion management right now, how useful that, um, that baseline SCAT 2 really is. You know, I think if you have a lot of athletes and you don't know all of your athletes very well, I think it's very useful to have at least a baseline exam um, so that you have something objective to go back to. What's far and away more useful is knowing your athletes well and knowing if um, how they're performing is off their game if they're not performing at the level you would expect them to. So having baseline testing is useful. The actual numbers on it might not be as helpful as just having a general idea of what the athlete is like, but a baseline SCAT 2 can be useful, and that is what the Zurich, um, Zurich statement recommends if possible. We'll do one more question here if it's yeah. okay with you. Okay, mm -hmm. um, this is a question from uh, John Bonke. Uh, how long do you feel an initial evaluation should take on the sideline? Um, it d depends a little bit on the situation, right? If someone is clearly concussed, you don't need to spend a lot of time on this. So, you know, if, if they're alert-oriented but clearly concussed, I don't go through the entire SCAT 2. I'll spend a couple of minutes talking to them, um, do some orientation, do some memory um, and concentration drills with them, but not go all the way through the whole thing. If someone comes off the field or if someone thinks that someone's behaving strangely and you're not sure if you should remove them from the contest or not, that's when I'll typically use the entire SCAT 2. Um, so that I get a better feel of how the athlete is performing. 
Okay. And so doing, doing the entire SCAT 2 would take 8 or 10 minutes on the sideline. Doing an initial evaluation that doesn't involve doing the SCAT 2 um, when, you, is, when someone is clearly concussed only takes a couple of minutes. So we, in the brain injury world, we say, and you can tell me if this is still true, when in doubt, sit them out? Yep. Still works. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But okay. I mean, I, th I think you have to have a reasonable um, amount of doubt, though, right? So there's 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 doubt, and then there's boy, this person really doesn't have a concussion, <laughs> right? And I think if you're going to try to convince yourself that the person is isn't injured, they don't have a concussion, you're going to allow them to return to play. I think you got to work your way all the way through the scat too to convince yourself of that. Great, thank you. Good. Other questions. Uh, there's one more. It's a, just a note from uh, Dusty Briggs. Uh, the scat two is available as an iPad app yep. and we'll uh and we'll it'll email the results uh to the clinician for printing. Correct. I get those emailed to me all the time. It's also password protected, which makes it um even better. So we have one that we use with our athletic trainers here uh with the Hawkeyes and it's password protected so no one can intercept it or get on someone's computer and see someone's um protected medical records. Great, that's what we have. Thanks. Yep, it works really well. Good. Other questions? That's it. Okay, moving on. Moving on to impact testing, um, and I want to be clear here. We use impact a lot. Um, I'm, I'm, it was part of my training. I trained at Wisconsin, and we used impact as part of the Wisconsin um, Sport Concussion Collaborative, um, and had been using it for a, a long time before I came here. Um, but there's a lot of places that don't use impact, and I don't think you need to feel like computer-based neurocognitive testing should be a mandatory part of your concussion evaluation. Um, what it does is improves your sensitivity for ongoing neurocognitive dysfunction. So once someone has has recovered clinically, they're they're back to normal, their symptoms are gone, they feel normal, they act normal, their balance and their memory and their concentration are all back to normal. This is a way to add sensitivity to that to make sure that their brain has um, fully recovered. It's far more useful if you have a baseline to compare them to. Um, it's not it's not nearly as useful if you're trying to do a post injury test without a baseline uh, to compare it to. Yeah, you can find statistical outliers sometimes, and that's um, a good reason to hold someone out. Um, but really, it's a, it's a more useful tool if you have a baseline. But I don't want people to feel like they can't do good concussion management if they're not using impact. Impact is a tool in the toolbox. It isn't the be on be all and end all of concussion care. Um, and so I know I know a lot of school districts have a lot of financial pressures and spending $25 on a baseline impact test on every athlete and getting a $10 uh, post injury test a few times after someone um, has had a concussion can be a real financial burden on a school district or on an athletics program. And you know if the the choices are have an athletic trainer available or have impact test, boy, I'd rather have an athletic trainer available than have than have impact testing. Um, I think it's useful, but I don't think that it should be mandatory in terms of concussion management, and I don't think you should feel like you're delivering suboptimal care if you don't have impact available. Anyway, um, impact is this computer-based neurocognitive testing. It has uh, multiple uh, domains. There's a symptom score um, that's almost exactly the same as the SCAT-2 symptom score. Um, there are tests of learning and uh, retention. There's some visual working memory tasks. There's some memory and visual motor speed tasks, um, and there's some uh, in, impulse uh, inhibition and visual motor speed uh, tasks. And it gives you a report that looks like this. Um, so this is from one of our, um, our Iowa City West uh, athletes. And the first page that gives you is some information about the athlete. So it tells you if they've had concussions before. Um, so this is this athlete's had one previous concussion. Um, that one did involve a loss of consciousness, um, and they missed about three games uh, because of that. And so this athlete um, went through the clinical process of, of uh, they were rested, they, um, they were checking in the training room and they got better and they came in to take uh, their post-injury test. So this was their baseline test from, um, from 2010. They came in after their injury and took this post-injury test. And even though their symptom score was very low, they still did very poorly on the test. So the numbers here are their absolute scores on each of these different domains in the test. And these are the percentiles. These are how they compare to other kids like them. So about the same age, um, same level in school. Um, and recently it started to compare it to people that play the same sport as well because um, the, the company has noted that there seems to be some clustering by the sport that people, people play um, in terms of their baseline. Um, scores. And so this person uh, did, did very poorly on their post-injury test um, and then uh, waited about a week, came back in, retook the test and still did very poorly on the test, waited another about a week and came back in and better here, right? So a lot of these domains are better. 
but there's still one domain that wasn't quite back to normal and so appropriately waited about another week and came back in and retook the test and this time did much much better um, on the test so the red numbers here are ones that are statistically significantly different from their baseline and as you can see there are no um, numbers that are red here so nothing that's statistically significantly different from the baseline um, these are their percentile so normal-ish range um, and then uh, another important part here is this impulse control composite and that's a measure of how evenly they took the test so a uh, high number um, indicates that they were distracted somehow during the test. So if someone uh, was intentionally sandbagging the test, they were trying to do poorly on it on purpose, you would see a higher number um, here. And so I always look at someone's baseline test, uh, mainly to make sure that they had a nice even even effort um, throughout the test. You know, I don't know if you've ever tried to intentionally do something poorly, but it's very hard to evenly do something poorly. You kind of go in little spurts. And so um, when, when someone's trying to sandbag the test, uh, you get this uh, high impulse control composite. It indicates that someone isn't um, doing a very good job in their effort. So those are the first two pages of the um, report, and that's where you spend the bulk of your time. If there's something weird about how the um, uh, athlete was performing, you can dig a little bit deeper down into the data and see where specifically they were doing uh, poorly on the on the test. Um, so it'll be a good example here. Uh, so for example, this athlete had a very difficult time remembering any of the designs, so those line drawings. Um, they were only able to recognize about half of those um, line drawings even when they were seeing them immediately after. And then another useful part of this test is that you can have them retake the symptom score immediately after the test. Now this isn't a default. Um, this isn't a default option on uh, on impact. You have to select it when you're setting up the post injury test. But if uh, you're worried about the test making them worse, so if you're worried about them getting more symptomatic, you can ask another set of symptom scores uh, at the end. And I, I tend to do that. Um, mainly because I'm dealing primarily with student athletes who are also trying to get back to school. And I think taking this impact test is a good proxy uh, for the stresses of being in the classroom as well. It requires a lot of concentration. It requires uh, a lot of attention to the task, just like being in school does. Um, so I'm always interested if the test itself makes them worse. And then if you like to look at things in pretty bars, you can look at them in bar graph form. This is the same data that we saw a couple pages ago. So I always make my residents and, and medical students and fellows uh, give me an assessment statement when they've when they've seen a patient. And so this particular um, assessment statement would be a 35-year-old fo 35 35 football player with a concussion. And notice I don't grade this, right? So there used to be these grading scales. There used to be the Cantu grading scale, the Colorado one, um, the American Academy of Neurology had a grading scale. There was one, um, the ACSM. Um, so there's, there's been a handful of grading scales over the year. Um, over the years that tried to predict how long someone would have to be out. So if you look at the Cantu grading scale, for example, they would say, oh, you would have to hold someone out for seven days, oh, this one's out for a month. Um, and, and so they would prospectively tell you how long you had to hold people out. The problem is that these had no real basis in reality. As, as we know, there's, there's no way to predict how quickly someone's going to recover from one of these injuries. So these grading scales have really gone by the wayside. And, and this is an important point to take away is that you shouldn't be grading concussions anymore. I still get referrals uh, from emergency rooms, even from neurologists from time to time um, with concussion uh, grades where someone said, oh, a grade two concussion. Um, but really that, that's gone by the wayside and no one is really grading concussions anymore. Um, and, and so I was talking a little bit about how nothing really predicts what their course is going to be like. But people always ask, well, what about loss of consciousness? Um, seems like loss of consciousness should predict a worsening course. Well, it, it seems intuitive, doesn't it? But it doesn't really predict the severity, how well you do on your neuropsych testing, or how long your symptoms are going to are going to last. Um, and so people have really moved away from using um, loss of consciousness, at least loss of consciousness of less than a minute. Um, to make any decisions uh, about what to do um, with, with someone who's, who's concussed. And it's really fallen out um, of favor because it doesn't have any predictive value. And it, it, that's one of those hard things to wrap your head around. How could, how could a concussion where you got knocked out not be worse than an injury where you didn't get knocked out? Well, if, if you don't believe me, there's a lot of papers on this. So here's a bunch of references that all say the same thing, that um, loss of consciousness doesn't really predict anything in terms of the outcome uh, following a concussion. So um, if, if you're more interested in this topic, there's plenty of reading to be done on it. Um, something else that sometimes makes people's radar are these, uh, there are the subtypes that were used in the Prague guidelines. So the Prague guidelines were from 2004. They were the guidelines that uh, preceded the Zurich guidelines that everyone uses now. And they got rid of the grade one, two, three concussions, but left another type of, of subtyping called simple versus complex concussions. Um, 
and that was a retrospective that was a retrospective grading. So you didn't know if someone was going to have a simple concussion or a complex concussion until you knew what their clinical course was like. So you couldn't call something a simple concussion or a complex concussion until they were um, until they were out a month. Um, if they had loss of consciousness, there were other other um, certain features. They were automatically a complex concussion. But most of it was about the duration and the severity of symptoms and how, and, um, how bad they were. Uh, three and four weeks out from the from the injury, and this has really gone away too. Um, it was just confusing for people. It didn't do anything to help us prospectively uh, manage concussions, um, and so people have really moved away from that as well. And so we've been left with the Zurich subtypes, which are none, right? And this is just an empty slide. There are no more concussion subtypes. There's no reason to grade things. You don't call it simple complex. You don't call it a mild. You don't call it a severe. A concussion is a concussion, and all concussions need to be treated individually. So if you don't if you don't remember anything else from the Zurich subtypes, it's that there's no prospective way to decide what you need to do with a concussion. You need to respond to what the athlete gives you. And if you think this is confusing, um, it, 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 it is. The reason it's confusing is because we get a new consensus statement every couple of years. So um, in the last, what, since 2005, there have been six new consensus. 2002, there have been since 2002, there have been uh, six new consensus statements on uh, concussion management, and they're all a little bit different. Um, and I think that's why it, this confuses people. Um, but pretty much everyone follows the Zurich statement. So if um, if you're going to know one consensus statement, know the Zurich statement. There is one that's more recent. Um, it's the ACSM update. On, um, on concussions, and it really mirrors the Zurich statement um, very closely. The only difference is that the ACSM consensus statement um, makes a strong stand on same-day return to play, saying that all same-day return to play should be disallowed, whereas the Zurich statement is fairly silent on it. It doesn't really comment one way or the other uh, whether same-day return to play should be allowed or not. So um, in this new ACSM statement, there's really not much different from the Zurich statement other than it's very strongly prohibitive um, of same-day return to play. So a few things to know about the Zurich statement. Number one, don't grade concussions. We just talked about that. Um, second thing is that the symptoms are really the key, and surveying the athletes frequently about their symptoms is the most important part of um, monitoring, monitoring someone with a concussion. Now, we talked about loss of consciousness um, already. It does not have any predictive value. Amnesia and seizures also have fairly, um, also have fairly poor predictive uh, value as well. Um, so what someone remembers around the time of the event, or even if they had a seizure around the time of the event, doesn't help you much prospectively in terms of how that athlete is going to do. Um, repeat concussions are probably bad. So if you have multiple concussions, it's probably worse than if you just had one concussion. Um, kids should probably be treated a little bit differently than adults should be treated. Um, what that means exactly is still a little bit controversial, and the Zurich statement is a little bit ambiguous about that. Um, it also is fairly clear that elite athletes should not be treated differently. Now, the elite athlete might have more resources available, um, so you might be able to do more to assess them. You might be able to return them to play faster just because um, you can spend more time with them and you can be more confident that their graduated return to play is going well. Um, but you shouldn't be taking more risks with an elite athlete. Um, and so an elite athlete might get back faster, not because it's 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 safer to do that with them, but because you can do that process maybe a little more safely if you have more resources um, to watch them and they have um, good neurocognitive testing. Uh, and then the the final thing is to use a graduated return to play, and this is something that everyone really agrees on. So what's graduated return to play? Um, seven steps. Um, I I simplify it a little bit. So the first step is complete rest, and you really want to rest someone until they're completely recovered. And once they're completely recovered, then you can start moving into some aerobic and strength exercise, and then some sport specific sport sport specific exercise, and then finally non contact drills, and finally a full contact practice before they get back to full game play. Um, how long each of these steps should take is a little bit controversial. Um, uh, most people at the high school and lower level will take about one step per day to move through this process. Um, some people move through it a little bit faster. Some people move through it a little bit slower, depending on the athlete and depending on the situation. Um, but a good rule of thumb is that they should be able to tolerate each one of these steps for about a day um, before they move on to the next step. And if they get symptoms at any of these levels, they should go back to the previous symptom-free level. So let's say for the sake of argument, they do okay with some aerobic exercise and they move on to strength exercise, and the strength exercise makes them worse, you want to go back to that easy aerobic exercise again um, before you start progressing them through return to play again. A couple of quick questions. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, good. Uh, first one in this kind of area, do you use the baseline, either the SCAT or IMPACT, um, do you use the baseline given freshman year 
uh, throughout the athlete's entire collegiate career, or do you recommend getting a new baseline at the start of each season? Yeah, so for the SCAT, that's relatively um, easy from a resource standpoint. We'd get a new one of those at the beginning of, of each season. Um, and we actually videotape them here at the University of Iowa. So um, we, they just set up a camera, and an athletic training student takes them through that. And if we need to go back and compare it to their baseline, we can go back and compare it to what they actually look like in their baseline SCAT. Um, so that's how we approach that, and it, work, it works fairly well. Um, it also gives us a fairly rich um, database to work with from a research standpoint because we can see how these people progress through their careers. Um, so yeah, so we redo the SCAT every year if we can, mainly because it's an easy thing to do. Um, you can take a student and, and do that, or you can have um, it, you can usually figure out a way to do that fairly cheaply and easily for most people. For impact testing, it's a little bit trickier, right? Um, as as people progress through, um, they there is less change as they age. So the difference between a 12 and a 14 year old in their baseline impact um, test is dramatically different than the difference between an 18 and a 20 year old, right? And so for younger kids, it's probably worthwhile testing them a little bit more frequently. And with older kids and athletes, you probably don't need to retest them quite as much, which is a problem, right? Because in general, the younger athletes are on teams that don't have as many resources. It's a whole lot easier for us to re-impact people here at the University of Iowa where we have a large athletic department budget than if you're some peewee football team, right? It's, 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 um, it's challenging because the resources are, are difficult. And so what I tell people is that if you can do it every two years, do it every two years. I'm talking about impact testing. If you can't, if you can't do it every two years, don't worry about it. Don't let it. Don't don't make it. Don't make it so that that's ruining your program. Um, you, you you have to take what you what you have, and remember that impact testing is really just a tool here. It's not a. Um, it's 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 not the only way that you have of assessing someone who has a concussion. It's part of the big picture. Um, so if you can do it every two years, do it every two years. If you can't do it every two years, don't don't stress about it. Okay, a follow-up also from Kelsey Huseman. Um, if an athlete has become symptom-free, however, has not passed one or more sections of the impact test, can you start them on a return-to-play progression? And uh, how soon would you have them retake the impact test? So yes is the short answer to that. Um, if people aren't passing, if people aren't passing their uh, impact test after a, a couple of tries, I do start taking them through return to play. But I don't take them um, to any contact or collision. So they can start progressing through all the way up to sport specific drills, but they cannot start doing any contact until we've got a good reason for why they're not passing their impact test. Um, and uh, I, I tend to test people about once a week um, if if they're not passing their their impact test. Uh, some people will test a little bit more frequently. Some people will test a little bit less frequently. And then some people uh, will have a fairly low threshold for going to formal neurocognitive testing. So maybe a step back on impact. Impact is a computer-based type of neurocognitive testing, and it's done mainly to replace the formal pen and paper um, sit down with a neuropsychologist kind of type of, of neurocognitive testing. And the main reason um, for that is that it's expensive. Formal neurocognitive testing, uh, depending on the market, can be anywhere from two to $5,000. It's, it's a remarkably time-consuming and expensive thing to do. Um, sometimes it takes a couple of days even to go through all the batteries and tests. And so some people, if someone is symptom-free, feels completely normal, but isn't passing their impact testing, will get them in to see a neuropsychologist fairly frequently for formal neurocognitive testing um, to help tease out if this is because they're doing poorly on the test or because they have depression, uh, if they have a situational depression related to their injury and not being able to play, those things can all impact your performance um, on the computer-based neurocognitive testing, and, and neuropsychologists are very good at teasing that out. Um, but that's the expensive way to do that. The, the easy way to do it is to just keep riding them out for a while. Thank you. Good. Other questions? Uh, not at this time. We'll catch them at the end. Okay, great. So same day return to play, and we started to talk about that a little bit. The um, Zurich statement is silent on this, so it, it's kind of remarkably silent. It was a contentious issue at the meeting. Um, I've talked to several people that were and that were on the consensus panel, um, and they spent a good chunk of their time talking about whether they should come down on one side or the other on uh, uh, same day return to play. Um, ultimately, they decided not to make any statement on it at all. Um, the, the people who argue that um, same day return to play should be prohibited uh, argue that uh, ex exactly what Jeff said before, that when in doubt you should sit them out, um, and that the, the best thing to do from a safety standpoint is to protect our athletes. People who are on the other side would say, well, clearly people have been returning to games um, 
uh, after concussions for decades. You know, maybe that was a problem, maybe it wasn't a problem, but we don't have um, good data as to whether or not same-day return to play is a safe thing to do or not. And they were worried about um, discouraging people from reporting concussion symptoms. So they were worried that kids wouldn't tell their athletic trainers that they have a concussion if they knew there was no way they were going to get back into the game. Um, so because of that contentious issue, the Zurich statement was silent on uh, re return to play. The ACSM statement, however, strongly discourages same-day return to play, and that's partly because of um, the people that wrote the statement. So Stan Herring is at um, University of Washington in, in Seattle, and he was the primary driver behind the Lifestead Law, which was the first of these concussion laws in the state of, of Washington. Um, and so he really focuses his work on trying to prevent people from getting these, these second impact um, type of injuries, and he feels that the um, the, the best way to do that is to sit as many concussed athletes out as possible. Um, and so that's why the ACSM statement strongly discourages uh, same-day return to play. My main um, national organization is the American Medical Society of Sports Medicine. I work very closely um, with the AMSSM, and there is a new statement that will be coming out from them hopefully this winter. It was supposed to be this fall, um, but it, I think it's going to be this winter now. And that will also strongly discourage same-day return to play. So there's a little snippet of the future for you on what the AMSSM statement is going to look like. Um, so, so this is what we just went through is the most important part of concussion management. So I, I just want to stop here and summarize for a second. Um, these, these are really the important steps of clinical concussion management. Uh, Preseason preparation, if you're going to use impact testing, if you're going to do baseline um, scat testing, if you're just going to get to know your athletes well, if you're going to have a concussion plan, if you're going to have a recognized um, uh, cl clinician that you're going to work with for your concussed athletes, having some preseason preparation is important. Recognition of the injury is the next most important step. Um, knowing what to do with an initial evaluation, knowing to rest someone when you've identified a concussion, monitoring the recovery closely um, before moving on to graduate or return to play, um, and whether or not to add in neurocognitive testing remains controversial. I think if you have the resources to do it, great. If you don't have the resources to do it, but that's not the most important part of this. The most important part of this is resting someone until they're recovered and then allowing the graduate return to play. Um, so moving on, so any questions about kind of basic concussion management? Was there any other questions on that before I move on to some other topics? There was one about impact. Uh, it was the question about what qualifications do would folks need to have to be able to administer impact, train, uh, impact testing? Yeah, um, so, so there, are tr there is training that you can do. You can do it through uh, impact. Um, people who do sports medicine fellowships, so sports medicine doctors, um, uh, are all fairly well trained in using neurocognitive, uh, computer-based neurocognitive testing. Um, and oftentimes we'll pair with people to be the, the medical person for uh, uh, an impact program. So for example, our athletic trainers um, here in the local high schools in Iowa City don't have formal um, training on, on using impact, but I'm the medical director for their impact program and we talk about cases very frequently. And at first that involved a lot of back and forth contact about what to do with, with these tests and when to administer them and, and how to use it uh, appropriately, but they have gotten um, you know, dramatically better over the last couple of years since we've started using it more and more in our community. So um, you don't really need a formal training in order to use it. You can just buy the test. It's way more useful if you either have formal training yourself through Impact. Uh, they put on seminars all the time. They do a lot of webinars. And so you could do something like this to learn how to use it as well. Um, or have someone um, that does sports medicine like I do that you can partner with to help you with some of the pitfalls. Thank you. That's what we have. Good. So moving on to the concussion law, um, I, I feel like we would um, be remiss to not discuss this a little bit. So I'm just going to walk through it so that everyone's seen it. Um, I, I assume most people have heard about it, but maybe you haven't seen it. So we're going to walk through it a little bit. Um, the first part of the law is, re is really more of, um, more of a statement of kind of guiding principles and what people agree on in terms of um, how to do uh, concussion management. Um, but there's not a lot of content in terms of what needs to be done with the first section. Now, moving on to the second section of the concussion law, um, this states that the, the athlete and the parents need to be made aware of concussions, and they will be giving some, some information, um, information sheet that will be provided by the athletic association, um, and that they have to sign um, a document saying that they know uh, about concussion injuries. The next part is uh, what to do if there is an injury. And so this requires coaches and officials to remove someone from a game if there are um, behaviors um, that are consistent with a brain injury. Um, and this really involves any extracurricular 
uh, activity. And this requires um, people who are at the event to remove players. And then the third section is what to do then. Um, and so uh, it, it says that, that the student athletes aren't allowed to return to play until a licensed healthcare provider trained in the management of concussions um, has uh, cleared them, has provided written clearance for them to return to participation. And now, what does a licensed healthcare provider mean? So it, it can be a lot of things. It can be a physician, it can be a nurse, it can be a chiropractor, um, it can be physical therapists, it can be um, licensed athletic trainers. Uh, it can be a lot of, uh, of different things. But I don't think that's the important part. I think the important part of this is um, the, is the provider that's trained in the evaluation and management of, oops, I need to do that, is it trained in the evaluation and management of concussions. Um, be, because there's a lot of heterogeneity in how much we as clinicians know about injuries, right? I, I do a lot of this. I'm fairly good at it. Um, but there are neurologists who do an awful lot less of this. Um, and there might be a neurologist that's very poorly trained in concussion management, and there might be an athletic trainer or a chiropractor that's extraordinarily well trained in concussion management. And so um, I, I don't get hung up so much on who this licensed provider is. Um, some people do. This has been a contentious area. Uh, but I think the most important thing is that is people that know what they're doing, um, know what they're doing, um, that are helping with with clearing people to return to play. And the other thing it's clear about is that the uh, these extracurricular activity is everything. So um, with sports, it's dance, it's cheerleading. It's a good thing that cheerleading is on the on this list. Cheerleading is actually the highest risk um, sport for concussion um, among among women. So this just clarifies what the um, extracurricular activities are. So moving on to pathophysiology, you know, I, I put a big question mark here because until just until recently, we really had no idea what the basic pathophysiology of concussions were, um, and we're still a little fuzzy on it. So if, if you want to remember anything about what the pathophysiology of concussions is, a question mark is not a bad thing to remember um, because because it, it, it is a little fuzzy. Um, but I'll share with you what we do know. And so if we take pathology, if we take chunks of brain from people that have died of other injuries or other problems um, when they had mild traumatic brain injury, we see a few things. So the, the first thing that we notice is that um, they typically have this microscopic axonal injury, um, which is the same type of injury as diffuse axonal injury, DAI, uh, which is a white matter problem. This is when shear forces uh, tear, through the, tear through the axons. Um, and, and when that happens, a couple of things happen. So one thing that occurs is that the neurotransmitters that normally move along the axon get to an ending spot where that tear is and don't have anywhere to go. And so you get these retraction bulbs. So there are areas uh, within the axon where there's a big bulb of built-up neurotransmitter that, um, that isn't able to continue down the axon. And then you get some degeneration past that that's called Wallerian degeneration that occurs past those retraction bulbs where the um, part of the neuron is dying and uh, degrading backward. You also see microglial clusters. So microglia are the macrophages of the brain. Um, they're the main immune cell in the brain. And they uh, scavenge for plaques and damage and infections and, and things like that. And when someone has had a brain injury of any type, um, these microglia cells um, cluster around the area of injury. And that can be seen um, pathologically as well. And so microglial clusters are something that are pathognomonic for brain injury um, when someone um, on, on brain biopsy. And then we talked a little bit already about tau proteins. So tau proteins are those proteins that stabilize microtubules to help provide the structure of the neuron. Um, and when you see them in excess, you can think of that as a scar in the brain. Um, it's also the common pathology in Alzheimer's disease. So that's what the pathology looks like. What does the patho pathophysiology look like? Well, some of this is contusions, right? So some of this is, is bruising in the brain, or there's, there's bleeding, or there's a direct bruise to parts uh, of the brain. But that's not the major player in terms of um, the, the pathophysiologic injury. The bulk of this are these axonal injuries, so these white matter injuries with rupture or stretch or shear of, um, of the axons, and then the eventual valerian degeneration, where the distal part of the axon starts to break down and really degrade. When this happens, the cell um, membranes become a little bit more permeable as well, and there's a release of these excitatory neurotransmitters from the um, injured axons. And those um, release, these uh, neurotransmitters, when they're released or leaked out of these, these injured axons, can um, uh, impair the function of nearby cells. And that's why you get such um, global uh, dysfunction um, with a concussion, even when it's uh, very small injuries of the brain that are actually pathologically involved.
And so what does this look like? And so, so on the right here in, in D, these are pretty normal um, neurons, right? They've never been injured. And they're labeled with um, um, some sugar, which would find its way into the cell if there was, um, uh, if, if there was holes in it, if it was leaking enough for it to, to find its way in. And then another dye that just makes the neurons show up. But in these other ones, so A, B, and C, these are axons in someone that's been injured. So these are, um, these are axons in someone that's had a brain injury. And as you can see, the dextrose has been able to seep its way into the cells here. So it finds its way through the cell membrane and causes some vacuolization, um, indicating that there's cell, uh, cell wall permeability in these injured axons. And so what do we, what, what can we do to um, take advantage of this? Well, we don't really, um, we can't really see these things on CT scan or MRI. Um, and really, clinically, these things shouldn't be used uh, very much in the management of concussion anyway. But there's a new technique um, called diffusion tensor imaging, which takes advantage of, um, uh, I'm sorry, there's a new technique called tractography, which takes advantage of a technique called diffusion tensor imaging. And this is kind of a confusing concept, so I'm going to draw it out here a little bit. Um, this, this depends on um, a, a thing called fractional anisotropy. So a fractional anisotropy just, um, describes how freely uh, a water molecule diffuses um, in, in the magnet. So um, if there is nothing that holds the water molecule to a certain linearity or, or points it in a, in a certain direction, the fractional anisotropy is zero. There's, there's no um, pole in any one particular direction. And if you have a completely normal neuron where you've got good structure and there's something that's pulling um, that, that, that keeps it trapped and makes it and forces it to follow down the length of, of the neuron, then that's um, a fractional anisotropy of one. And so that's um, what this takes advantage. Of. That's what this type of imaging takes advantage of. When someone has an injury and these axons are injured, there is less fractional anisotropy. So these water molecules are able to find their way in and out of cells, and they don't just head in the same direction as the neuron. And so you're able to use the, this technique um, to look at um, a, a brain and look at white matter and see how much of the white matter tracks um, are, are moving in, in the right direction or are pulling things in the right direction. And so this is called diffusion tension imaging, um, and you get pictures that look like this, um, where the white matter has nice um, has a, a lot of movement along it. So this is the this is imaging of a normal corpus callosum. Now, um, as, as fractional anisotropy goes up, um, the, the, the diffusion is, is more. So these are traumatic brain injury patients here, the black dots, and these are control dots here. Um, and this is their post-concussion score. So this is a, um, a score of their concussion severity. Um, and it, as you can see, it's not a perfect trend. But in general, those that have a more severe injury also have more um, fractional anisotropy. So this is more of a uh, clinical or a research tool at this point. It's not really useful from a clinical standpoint. We're not doing this clinically, but it illustrates how we're moving in the direction of being able to image parts of the brain that are um, actually Im actually injured um, in concussion. Uh, what the future holds for this is trying to get an idea of what parts of the brain are actually injured. So you take people that are normal subjects and you compare what their um, what their diffusion tensor imaging looks like uh, compared to uh, injured or, or injured injured athletes or people who have had a traumatic brain injury, and then you can pull out the parts of the brain that are injured, and you can see how much injury there is there. So this is an active area of research right now, trying to map out the parts of the brain that tend to be more injured in concussion um, by comparing what the the diffusion tensor imaging looks like in a trauma subject compared to someone that's a control subject. Um, the holy grail, however, for testing is some type of biomarker. So you, if you think about the kidney. When someone has kidney disease, you can measure their, um, their uh, creatinine and know if their kidney is working well enough. Well, we don't really have something like that uh, for a concussion. But boy, wouldn't it be nice if we had something that was easy to sample, um, was sensitive and specific, and it gave you a good, a good signal. Um, you'd be able to tell when someone actually had, it, had an injury. Uh, and a lot of people are working on this, on this as well. And several of them are, are in development. And I'm not going to read this to you, um, but these, these are all things that people are working on, um, are, are working on from a research standpoint that might be tools that we could use in the future for detecting uh, concussion either in a blood or a saliva or a CSF test. Um, so this might be coming down the road, but for now, um, it's not quite ready. 
an interesting test that is um, being used a little bit are some um, polymorphisms in this uh, apolipoprotein E4 um, uh, gene. So the apolipoprotein uh, is a protein that helps stabilize um, certain uh, cholesterol molecules. And we found that people who have the ApoE4 um, promoter or, or ApoE4, um, um, uh, I'm sorry, the ApoE4, or the ApoE2, or the ApoE promoter genes um, are at higher risk of uh, having a concussion, and they're also at higher risk for um, having more severe symptoms. So I got a few take-home points. Um, our, our understanding of concussions is evolving. If you manage concussions, we want to make sure that you're following the Zurich guidelines mainly. Um, following a stepwise return to play is probably the most important part of concussion management to make sure that they um, are fully cleared and their brain is fully recovered before they return to play. Neurocognitive testing is useful for improving our sensitivity to ongoing neurocognitive um, dysfunction in the setting of a clinically diagnosed um, concussion. And there are probably some fancy lab and imaging tests that are on the way, but for right now, we're not quite ready to do that yet. So that's all I have from a content standpoint. Are there questions, things people want to talk about? We do have a question. Um, here's one. In a case where an athlete presents with a headache that may be caused by a concussion-like mechanism of injury, but that is their only symptom, how would you proceed? And especially if this occurs in hot summer months, could it be an issue of dehydration versus concussion? Yep, absolutely. And that's why it's important to have good athletic trainers around. <laughs> I, it, 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 that's an impossible, it's an impossible situation, um, and it happens every day. For those of you out there who have played football, you leave football practice with a headache pretty commonly, right? And clearly not every one of those injuries is, is a concussion or at least a clinically important concussion. So it's a very difficult, um, it's a very difficult issue. Uh, I tend not to um, tend to restrict everyone with a headache, mainly because I'd be restricting everybody all the time. Um, however, there is a difference between the type of headache that you have from dehydration or from exertion or from wearing a helmet that's too tight for too long um, and what a concussion feels like. For those of you that have had concussions, it just feels wrong. It just it, it feels weird. It's a different type of sensation. And so I worry more about someone who tells me, you know, I feel wrong, I feel fuzzy, I feel off, this just doesn't feel right, I don't feel like myself, than I do someone who reports a headache. So no, I don't restrict every headache. Very good. Um, there's another question here. Uh, Dr. Cantu, I think Robert Cantu, has suggested that uh, his recommendation is that for youth b beneath the age of 14 that zero concussions are indicated, that his recommendation is not to have kids younger than 14 compete in athletic uh, sports that concussion can, can happen. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's it's hard to know, um, and and there's no data on, on either side of this, and people can argue either side of this fairly convincingly. So there's kind of this ish, this yuck factor of having younger kids get concussions, right? I mean, it seems like a bad idea to have a developing brain have to um, absorb an injury, reco and recover from that injury while while it's still developing. The other side of that argument is that younger brains are more are more plastic, and they tend to recover better from a traumatic brain injury, at least more severe traumatic brain injury. Now, if if you're a younger kid who has a bad traumatic brain injury, say from a motor vehicle accident, you're more likely to recover from that injury than an older person who has a traumatic brain injury from from, from the same type of injury. So it's it's really hard to know. Um, you know I think that's the direction that um, we're moving as a society. We're moving more and more towards protecting um, kids from traumatic brain injury. Um, uh, some people are more extreme about this in terms of restricting kids from all contact and collision sports at a young age or uh, turning turning those sports into um, lower contact sports, so taking away checking and hockey, for example, um, making uh, football or flag football or touch football or other types of, um, uh, of skill development type of football at younger ages, um, taking away contact practices. There's a lot of ways to do that, and that's clearly, clearly been the trend is to uh, um, involve kids in less contact. Um, but at the same time, there's not a lot of data on either side um, that informs us on how dangerous it really is. Very good. Uh, one additional question. Have you had to deal with high school parents who claim their son or daughter can be overdramatic when explaining their concussion symptoms? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. And how do you deal with that? <laughs> yeah, it's tricky. you got to believe the kid, right? Um, 
you know, they're they're the ones that are are experiencing the symptoms. And you know, there's probably a few kids that don't want to play football anymore, and that's why they're so dramatic about their their concussion. But you know what? It's not my job to force them back on the field if they don't want to be on the field. I'm not going to force someone back to play when they feel like they're not ready to play. Fair enough. Um, Will is is it your sense that um, the odds of increased Alzheimer's uh, increase? with increased concussions? Um, it's maybe not Alzheimer's. So there's um, this, this is another kind of area of controversy is how much is chronic traumatic encephalopathy like Alzheimer's disease. And they seem to be different. So while they share some common um, pathology, they tend to have slightly different um, uh, different clinical courses. So they both involve tau deposition. Um, the brains look similar in people who have Alzheimer's disease and those who have chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, but the clinical patterns seem to be a little bit different. People with Alzheimer's tend to be less aggressive. People with chronic traumatic encephalopathy tend to be more aggressive. People with Alzheimer's tend to have less depression. People with chronic tra traumatic encephalopathy tend to have more depression. The dementia part of it is pretty similar, though, and it's the same type of dementia pattern um, where people are inquisitive. They keep asking the same questions over and over. Um, there are other types of dementia where people aren't inquisitive, where they don't um, have, have that same type of repetitive uh, question asking behavior, but the types of dementia between Alzheimer's and chronic traumatic encephalopathy um, do seem to be quite similar. So I think they overlap e with each other. They share, um, they clearly share some pathologic features, and they clearly share at least some clinical features, but at least for now, I think we should consider them as distinct clinical entities. Good. Jessica uh, Gum has a question. What is your trigger or when do you recommend further evaluation, such as a CAT scan or an MRI? Um, someone who's worsening. So, you know, and, um, and when I say worsening, I mean acutely, acutely after the event. So in the few hours after, after the injury, if someone is um, progressively getting worse and worse headache, they're getting more sleepy, they're getting more confused in the hours after the injury, that's someone that... Um, that it's worthwhile imaging. You know, if someone just isn't recovering quickly, that's not worth imaging. And I think that's where the bulk of our MRIs and CT scans um, get used. They don't get used because someone has had a, a neurologic deterioration. They're getting used because someone just isn't recovering fast enough for the parents or the, or the coach's liking. Um, and I don't think that's a good use of resources at all. Um, but the, a lot of CTs and MRIs that are done out of emergency departments for concussions are done for that very reason right there. But in terms of when to use it, I, I use them when someone has had an acute neurologic deterioration. Very good. Uh, do you have thoughts on the king Devic test oh, that's really uh, on the sideline? Sorry? Yeah, that's really interesting. So I'm actually doing, a, we're doing a research project right now on the King-Devic test. Um, and that's a so, vision-specific test, I think. Yeah, exactly. So the King-Devic test does, uh, measures visual saccades. It used to be a kindergarten readiness test back in like the 70s or 80s, and it was a terrible one for that, so it kind of got shelved. Um, and now that's been picked up again um, as a concussion evaluation tool. And MMA has really taken this and ran with it. So there's a lot of MMA leagues that are using the King-Devic test um, between rounds to screen for concussions in people with really no evidence that it's um, all that useful. I take that back. There's one, pa there's one paper uh, that was published by the people that developed the King-Devic test um, suggesting that it could be useful for detecting concussion in, in MMA um, athletes. So I want, there's not no evidence. There's limited evidence. Um, however, just I think two months ago now, um, there was a paper that was published where they took people who had uh, fatigue. They took residents, uh, medical residents, um, and had them do the King Devic test before and after their um, their call shifts. And they did dramatically poorer on the King Devic test after their um, call shifts. So at least it's not it's at least not specific for chronic, for um, traumatic brain injury. Um, at, at least cognitive fatigue is enough to make you perform poorly on the test. And then the study that we're doing right now is looking to see if uh, physical fatigue um, can make you uh, perform poorly on the test as well. Um, so we're taking our track athletes and having them do the test before and after hard workouts to see if uh, that makes a difference in their uh, King Devic scores. Um, but I, I don't think that this is a test that's going to gain a lot of traction primarily because it's not uh, specific enough. Very good. Um, I think we have, uh, that's really the end of our questions. So if, uh, if there are no more questions, uh, oh, there's one more. Um, nope, that's, sorry, that was a comment, not a question that said thank you for the webinar. Uh, this, is, uh, this was really, really helpful. Um, really appreciate you, Dr. Peterson, taking the time to, to walk us through this concussion in Iowa. I want to remind people that uh, for additional information uh, about brain injury, 
um, or if they have athletes or parents that want additional information about brain injury recovery services, treatments, um, just the sequelae, you can reach us at 855-444-6443. Uh, the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa did work with the National Football League and others, Iowa Athletic Trainers Society as well, to get the law that uh, Dr. Peterson talked about, to get that law passed in July of uh, 2011. So it's been on the books for about a year, and uh, there's just been increasing awareness and, and uh, call for information. So we'll try to meet that need. Also, the Iowa uh, Athletic Trainer Society uh, website is up here for additional information there, and we will be sending an email out to those attendees at this webinar uh, regarding continuing education unit credits for um, athletic trainers as well as certified brain injury specialists. So again, uh, Dr. Peterson, thank you so much for taking time with us today. Yeah, no problem. And uh, we do have one additional webinar. Whoops, let's see if I can bring that up. Uh, December 4th of 2012. Um, we'll be sending out to all of you as well as others uh, some information on how to register for that. Uh, that'll be, again, Leslie um, Dunnick uh, from Central College, uh, Assistant Professor of Exercise Science, and that'll be at 3.45 p.m. We chose that time so it might be a little bit more accessible to some of the school-based folks who might want to know about that. Again, we can't thank you all for uh, joining us, but we do, and uh, we'll sign off now. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.